Ernest Hemingway is almost as famous for his lifestyle as his writing. Mixing with a wealthy and glamorous set, he indulged his passions for hunting and fishing and was always throwing himself into something new. He didn't have an easy start in life with an overbearing father and distinctly odd mother and a heavy genetic loading for mental instability. But Hemingway redefined the boundaries of storytelling with his unique and characteristically concise writing style and challenging themes. From the cafes of Paris to the savannas of Africa, the life he lived was like the characters he created, full throttle, flawed, but always fascinating. Welcome to Insane History. I'm Professor Graham Yorston, and today we're exploring the life of Ernest Hemingway, Nobel Prize winning author and adventurer. Join me as we uncover the man behind the myths, the bravery and the vulnerability, the bullishness and the sensitivity, the determination to be in control of his own destiny and avoid the fate of his father, and the sad final year of one of literature's greatest figures. Ernest Hemingway was born in 1899 in the prosperous suburb of Oak Park, Illinois, less than 10 miles from downtown Chicago, a place he would later describe as a town of wide lawns and narrow mines. His father Clarence was a family doctor and his mother Grace a singer who declined a contract at the Metropolitan Opera in New York to return to her hometown and marry apparently because she thought that being exposed to bright theatre lights might further harm her delicate eyes, which had been damaged by scarlet fever as a child. Was it really her eyes, or was she temperamentally unsuited to a life on the operatic stage, being told what to do and at the mercy of the critics? Ernest was the second born of their six children, all of whom were delivered by their father. Much has been made of his mother dressing him in gingham frocks and fancy bonnets and keeping his hair long. And feminist writer Mary Dearborn suggests this led to an ambivalence about and fascination with gender roles and sexuality. Perhaps, but putting young boys in dresses was not unusual at the time and far more practical for those tasked with changing the nappies. Which was not Ernest's mother. Grace did not do housework focusing her energy instead on painting and encouraging the children to explore literature, art and music. She read them hundreds of books, taught them songs and poetry, and took them to the opera, theatre and museums. She insisted all of her children learn a musical instrument and kept Ernest out of school for a year to scratch away at the cello. It was his father who took a more active role in the domestic chores of the household, planning meals, cooking and helping with the laundry supported by live-in maids and nannies. But it wasn't all books, singing and frilly clothes. Ernest developed a passion for hunting and fishing, nurtured by his father on summers spent at their country home on Walloon Lake in northern Michigan. A love of the outdoors which stayed with him throughout his life. But his father would have sudden switches of mood and angry outbursts, often taking it out on Ernest. He suffered from episodes of profound depression and had to spend periods away from the family to lift his spirits. Sometimes at the lake house, sometimes in New Orleans. His mother too was inconsistent in her affections. Her mood was unstable. She slept badly and she had frequent somatic symptoms including five day headaches. His father eventually ended his own life, shooting himself with his own father's Civil War revolver and Ernest blamed his mother for driving him to this. The extent to which these complex family dynamics affected Ernest's own relationships has been a topic of endless debate, with the suggestion that his lifelong assertion of masculine power grew out of his emotional need to exorcise the painful memory of his mother asserting her superiority over his father. At school, Ernest excelled at sport and performed with the school orchestra, 
He also honed his writing skills by editing the school newspaper and yearbook, and penning the occasional love poem. After graduating in 1917, he decided not to go to college, but took a job as a cub reporter on the Kansas City Star for six months. He credited the newspaper's editor with changing his wordy, high school writing style into clear, provocative English by following the paper's style guide. Use short sentences, use short first paragraphs, use vigorous English, be positive, not negative. In April 1917, America joined the war that had already ravaged Europe for three years. At 18, Hemingway was too young to enlist without parental permission, and father wasn't keen. Plus, his poor eyesight meant he probably would have been rejected anyway. But he talked a lot about getting into the war in his letters to his family, and after arriving in Kansas City in October 1917, he joined the Missouri National Guard. In February 1918, the American Red Cross announced it was seeking volunteers to join the ambulance service in Italy, and Hemingway signed up. After two weeks training in New York, Hemingway and his fellow volunteers were dispatched off to France. Brief stops in Bordeaux and Paris, which was under bombardment from the Germans' massive new Kaiser Wilhelm gun 70 miles away, and then he was in Milan. His first assignment was to help transport the injured and dead from a massive munitions plant explosion. It was a grisly scene with the bodies and body parts of female workers strewn everywhere. But Hemingway was unfazed, saying it was just like the General Hospital back in Kansas City. In his letters home, he couldn't hide his enthusiasm and excitement at being in Italy and doing something worthwhile, telling them he was having a wonderful time. A few days later, he was sent to the front line at Fossalta di Piave, 20 miles from Venice. He was taking chocolate and cigarettes to troops in a dugout, when an Austrian mortar shell landed just a few feet away from him. The blow knocked him unconscious and half buried him. Shrapnel ripped into his right foot and knee and struck his thighs, scalp and hand. Two Italian soldiers standing between Hemingway and the shell's point of impact were not so lucky. One was killed instantly, and another had his legs blown off and died soon afterwards. A third was badly wounded, and this one Hemingway hauled onto his back and despite his own injuries, carried him to the first aid station, picking up some extra machine gun wounds into the bargain. His bravery earned him an Italian war medal. He required immediate surgery at a distribution centre and then five days treatment in a field hospital before being transferred for recuperation to the Red Cross Hospital in Milan. There, he spent three months recovering from his injuries and slowly falling in love with Agnes von Kurowski, a vivacious and flirty American Red Cross nurse seven years his senior. In October, she was sent to Florence and a fortnight later Hemingway was dispatched to the Monte Grappa front where he promptly contracted hepatitis and had to be returned to the hospital. Agnes too returned and they picked up their romance for nine heady days before she was sent off to another hospital. He wrote passionate letters to her daily and she responded in equally affectionate terms, sometimes signing herself Cattiva Ragazza or Naughty Girl. Hemingway returned home on the SS Giuseppe Verdi in January 1919, urging Agnes to join him as soon as possible so they could be married. Although still only 19, he started saving for their wedding and continued writing daily. But the frequency and tone of Agnes's letters cooled off, and in March she wrote to say she was engaged to an Italian officer. She never married her Italian officer. But when Hemingway heard from a mutual friend that she was coming back to the US, he expressed a devout hope that she might trip on the gangplank and knock out her front teeth. Hemingway's experiences in Italy plunged the young man with his middle-class, privileged upbringing into the extremes of human suffering and brutality. He saw with his own eyes the fragility of existence, the barbarism of war, but also the courage and nobility that can emerge from such darkness, themes which would form a major part of his writing throughout his life. His physical wounds left scars, 
but his rejection by Agnes also scarred him. And one biographer suggests that as a result, in subsequent relationships, Hemingway always followed a pattern of abandoning a new wife before she could abandon him. But it seems to me that these were never thought out decisions. Rather, he just got bored with one and moved on to whoever else was around at the time. But I do think that he had mental scars from the war. He was only 18 when he came so close to dying or being permanently disabled. He said later of the incident, when you go to war as a boy, you have a great illusion of immortality. Other people get killed, not you. Then, when you are badly wounded the first time, you lose that illusion and you know it can happen to you. The role of trauma in the evolution of Hemingway's personality and writing has been relatively underplayed. And by trauma, we need to consider both the psychological aspects of witnessing the terrible sights of mutilated bodies in the munitions factory catastrophe, as well as the survivor guilt of being so close to men who are blown to pieces in front of him. And the physical trauma of being next to an exploding mortar round. Modern ideas about post-traumatic stress disorder were not formulated until the 1980s. And at the time of the First World War, all sorts of names were given to the stress reactions of combat personnel. One of the main theories about the cause of shell shock at the time was that it was the result of barrow trauma, or the shock wave from an explosion. And to this day, neuroscientists are still debating the role of mild traumatic brain injury in combat veterans with PTSD. But whatever name is put to it, and whatever the exact mechanism is, war changes people. It always has. And it changed Hemingway. Back in the US, smarting from his rejection and struggling to readjust to the routines of normal life, he threw himself into his outdoor pursuits to try and find some peace, and took a job with the Toronto Star Weekly, which gave him his first bylines. One of his articles was a bitingly satirical piece about Canadians who avoided the war. Then it was on to Chicago, where he met his first wife, Hadley Richardson. Although eight years his senior, she was painfully shy and had what he described as a nurturing instinct. Her father had ended his life when she was 12, believing he had financial difficulties and her mother had just passed away. But none of that mattered. Hemingway was infatuated and immediately knew she was the girl he was going to marry. After a honeymoon at the Hemingway Lake House, where they had miserable weather and both came down with fevers, they headed to Paris, funded by Hadley's inheritance and Hemingway's job as a foreign correspondent. The couple lived in a cramped apartment in the arty Latin Quarter, above a rowdy dance hall, and Hemingway worked in a room he rented nearby. They had introductions to the American expatriate writers living in Paris, Ezra Pound and Gertrude Stein, and they met James Joyce at the famous Shakespeare and Company bookshop. Hemingway filed over 80 stories for the Toronto Star, covering the war between Greece and Turkey as well as travel pieces. His style of reporting was fresh and new. He wanted the reader back home to understand the impact of events on ordinary people, the hidden costs of war, the displacement of peoples from their native lands, the hunger, the disease, the suffering. The couple journeyed around the continent to Spain, Italy and Germany, sometimes together and sometimes apart. The first big test of their relationship was when Hadley, waiting for a train to Geneva at the Gare de Lyon, lost a suitcase filled with Hemingway's manuscripts. She was in tears for the entire eight-hour journey, but on her arrival, Hemingway was reassuring, telling her not to worry, as he had carbon copies. When she then told him the suitcase contained the manuscripts, the carbon copies, and all of his notes, he wasn't quite so calm, rushing back to Paris to see if anything was left behind but there was just a single short story left. His novel and all the other stories were gone forever. But undeterred and determined to regroup, he knuckled down into recreating the work he had lost. 
His relationship with Hadley was never quite the same afterwards, however. He couldn't have been in a better place for a budding writer. 1920s Paris was the epicentre of the artistic revolution that was transforming literature, music, the visual arts, fashion, architecture, pretty much every field of human endeavour. New ideas in one art form inspired innovations in another, and the Hemingways were regular visitors to the soirees organised by Gertrude Stein, the earth mother of modernism, where they met other writers and painters including Picasso and Miro. In September 1923, the couple returned to Toronto, where, a month later, their son was born, John Hadley Nicanor, named after a Spanish matador Ernest had seen during their visit to Pamplona for the famous Festival of San Fermin and Running of the Bulls. With baby Jack just a few months old, the family returned to Paris and moved into a new apartment, not much larger and uncomfortably close to a busy sawmill the incessant noise of which forced Hemingway to retreat to his favourite cafes to work. But he did manage to get his first books published. Three stories and ten poems, and an experimental slim volume of 18 vignettes or ultra-short stories of no more than a few lines each. Critic Edmund Wilson was ecstatic, writing that Hemingway had almost invented a form of his own, and that the book had more artistic dignity than anything else about the war that had yet been written by an American. If you've never seen these, I definitely recommend taking a look. They can be downloaded for free. And despite their extreme brevity, they managed to create quite an impression, with every word loaded and meaningful, like a kind of short story haiku. He was also working on a novel, and helping Ford Maddox Ford edit the short-lived but influential Transatlantic Review, which published works by Pound, Dos Passos, Joyce, the eccentric German poet and artist Elsa Baroness von Freitag Lorinkhoven, and Gertrude Stein, as well as some of his own short stories. And he met the ultimate burn-the-candle-at-both-ends couple Scott and Zelda Fitzgerald. He got on well with Scott, who was encouraging about his work, but he did not like Zelda, considering her to be mad and feeling that she was taking Scott away from his more serious writing. The dislike was mutual, Zelda believing Hemingway to be a phony. Everything seemed to be going well, but in the winter of 1925, Hemingway met and began an affair with 32-year-old Pauline Pfeiffer, an independently wealthy journalist from Arkansas who had moved to Paris to work for Vogue magazine. When Hadley found out, she agreed to a separation, but insisted on a 100-day period of him not seeing Pauline. Hemingway acceded, but then sank into a state of abject depression and had morbid thoughts of ending it all, such that his friends were genuinely worried. He felt guilty. Hadley had done nothing wrong and had always been supportive of his literary aspirations. So how much of his dejection was genuine and how much a self-indulgent orgy of self-castigation, as described by one writer, is unclear. But as soon as he was reunited with Pauline, he felt better, and he was able to reassure Fitzgerald that he was all through with a general bumping off phase. In 1926, The Sun Also Rises was published. It portrays the lives and attitudes of a hard-drinking, fast-living set of disillusioned young expatriates in post-war Paris, for whom the war had changed everything. It received mixed reviews, however. Some critics loved it, but others hated it, struggling to connect with the character's disenfranchisement with life. The fiercest criticism came from his mother, who told him he was prostituting a great ability to the lowest uses, and that it is a doubtful honour to produce one of the filthiest books of the year. Four months after his divorce from Hadley, he converted to Catholicism and married Pauline Pfeiffer. They honeymooned in Le Gros du Roi in the south of France, where he contracted anthrax. Yes, anthrax, a bacterial infection caught from livestock or animal products that was still relatively common in Europe at the time, and which was fatal in 20% of cases. 
So, just to recap, he's still only 27, but he's almost had his crown jewels ripped off by shrapnel, he's been machine gunned, he's had hepatitis, and now anthrax. And this is just the beginning of the catalogue of injuries and ailments he'll go on to suffer throughout his life. His next collection of 14 short stories was published later in the year. Again, some critics loved it, Cosmopolitan magazine's editor-in-chief calling his boxing tale 50 grand one of the best stories that ever came into my hands. But others hated it, author Joseph Wood Crutch calling the collection sordid little catastrophes about very vulgar people. By the end of the year, Pauline was pregnant and wanted to move back to America. So, on the recommendation of John Dos Passos, they set sail for Key West in Florida. But not before Hemingway gashed his head open and concussed himself by pulling a skylight down on his head, thinking it was a toilet chain. This left him with a prominent forehead scar for the rest of his life, which he was always a little shy to talk about, seeing as how it didn't quite fit his He-Man adventurer image. He had lived in Paris for six years, first with Hadley and then with Pauline. But when he left, he would never again live in a big city. It's hard to imagine Hemingway without Paris. The connections he made with modernist writers and artists in the melting pot of ideas of the Anne Folle, the crazy years, were pivotal in developing his style and giving him the confidence to try something new, to find his own voice. People visit Paris to breathe in some of that history. Le Dôme, Le Coupole, Les Deux Magots, and Harry's New York Bar. His favourite was La Cloiserie des Lilas in Montmartre, where they even have his customary place at the bar marked with a plaque. And of course, Shakespeare and Company, all still doing business and all worth a visit. After spending time in Key West, they travelled to Kansas City, where their son Patrick was born in June. Pauline had a difficult delivery, but never one to waste good material, Papa Hemingway managed to incorporate a fictionalised version of the event into his next novel. In December 1928, he was about to board a train back to Florida, when he received a cable telling him that his father had taken his own life. He knew his father had been ruminating about money, and he had written to him trying to tell him not to worry. But his letter arrived just a few minutes too late. His mother had written in March to say that Clarence was in very bad shape. Heart attacks, cramps and neuritis in his right arm, so he cannot lift it to shave or brush his hair. And in November, Dad has been falling off terribly in weight and appetite and unable to sleep. And last week he seemed to go all to pieces. He really thought he was going to die. At the inquest, the family tried to gloss over his long history of mental ill health as it was far more acceptable to succumb to diabetes and financial worries than be tainted by the suspicion of insanity. But Ernest had no illusions, saying one time, I'll probably go the same way. Eventually, three, possibly four of the six Hemingway children took their own lives. Ernest in 1961, Ursula in 1966, Lester, also a writer in 1982, and although his eldest sister Marceline's death in 1963 was deemed to have been from natural causes, some in the family suspected otherwise. But Hemingway just tried to get his head down and finish his novel. It was a struggle though. He tried out 47 different endings before settling on one. It was serialised in Scribner's magazine in 1929, but with much of his character's earthy dialogue censored. The F word was obviously never going to be allowed in the 1920s, but for some reason, bedpan had to go as well. And the scenes of love that are very sparingly described in the uncensored version, no more than hints really, also had to go. Hemingway was furious, but he knew he had no choice. The critics were positive and the book sold well, confirming his status as a major American writer and an Oscar-nominated movie soon followed. For the first time, he was earning a living from his writing. In the early 1930s, he spent his winters in Key West and summers in Wyoming, where he hunted deer, 
elk and grizzly bear, often joined by friends and family. But when driving back from an expedition to Yellowstone with John Dos Passos one time, he came off the road and sustained a serious spiral fracture of his right upper arm. His surgeon bound the bone with kangaroo tendon and then immobilized it by bandaging it to his chest. Hemingway was in hospital for seven weeks, but his damaged radial nerve supplying the muscles in his hand took a year to fully recover, during which time he suffered intense pain and had restricted movement. His third child was born in November 1931 in Kansas City, another difficult birth after which Pauline was advised to have no further children. Assigned male at birth and named Gregory, Gloria underwent gender reassignment surgery in her 60s and after a difficult life battling bipolar disorder, alcohol and drugs, she died in the Miami-Dade Women's Detention Center after being arrested on charges of indecent exposure and resisting arrest. But back in 1931, life was good. Pauline's uncle bought the growing family a house in Key West with a carriage house which they converted into a writing studio. Ernest would wake up early and write during the mornings when there was no one around to disturb him. But afternoons and evenings were playtime, fishing, sailing and drinking sessions at his favourite bar, Sloppy Joe's. In 1932, Death in the Afternoon was published, a non-fiction book about the history and traditions of Spanish bullfighting that he had become fascinated by on his trips to Pamplona. In 1933, he went on a 10-week safari to Kenya and Tanganyika with Pauline. The trip provided material for another non-fiction work, Green Hills of Africa, as well as a number of short stories. And allowed him to blast away at anything that moved on the Serengeti. Now, I know some people love hunting, but for me... The images of Hemingway grinning over his African kills are a bit of a problem. Fishing, fine, but shooting rhinos and elephants? Really? But at the time, big game hunting was a popular pastime for the well-heeled who wanted to show how brave they were. And this is just as much a part of Hemingway's life as clacking away at his typewriter in a Parisian garret. During his travels, Hemingway contracted amoebic dysentery, a protozoal gut infection, another of his illnesses that is relatively easily treated nowadays, but in the pre-antibiotic era was a real killer. There was a US outbreak in the same year at the Chicago World's Fair that affected a thousand people, of whom 98 died. Hemingway was lucky though. He just suffered a prolapsed rectum and had to be flown to a hospital in Nairobi. Green Hills of Africa was published in 1935 to unenthusiastic reviews. He felt the critics had killed his book and went into a deep depression, saying he was ready to blow his lousy head off. He also began to blame his wife and Jane Mason, a glamorous heiress with whom he had been having a torrid affair for three years, for somehow souring its reception. Hemingway was 38 years old. He was a major writer even if some of his books weren't as well received as others. He had a comfortable lifestyle, far enough away in Key West that he had time to himself, but not so far that he was isolated. He had enough money to do whatever he wanted, whenever he wanted. And he had an adoring family, and at this point, only one ex-wife. But he was bored. He needed something more than knocking back a bottle of scotch a day. Excitement, danger, new love, novelty. And in December 1936 he bumped into Martha Gellhorn, who got him all fired up about going to Spain to cover the Civil War. I'll explore this next phase of Hemingway's life and his later years in a separate video, his Spanish Civil War experiences, his spying activities, his involvement in the Second World War, his relationship with wives number three and four, and the illness that ultimately cost him his life. I'll also try to make sense of one of the most complex personalities of the 20th century, a man of great sensitivity and profound insights, but a man full of contradictions who could also be infuriatingly selfish and bitter, a man full of life and enthusiasm who tried so hard to exercise the demons of his youth, 
but he was tragically unable to escape his genetic inheritance. It's a fascinating story. If his life were a novel, nobody would believe it. So please, join me for Hemingway, The Later Years. <laughs>